just as they were about to move to a major record label. Morrissey, the singer and songwriter, Johnny Marr, the guitarist and music man. The songs, witty, unexpected, viewed from a resolutely northern perspective, Morrissey became an unlikely star, promoting celibacy, literature, northern values and Coronation Street. The latest album, Strange Ways Here We Come, is considered their best. Their fans were articulate and obsessive. Their own influences you may find rather surprising. Older viewers could find them surprisingly comforting. Here then, Tony Knox's South Bank show film, The Smiths, from start to finish. Last night I went out walking, my intentions were to click. But the sights I saw while walking out, they nearly made me sick. I must admit I saw some girls, attractive little dears. Arm in arm with ugly men with cauliflower ears. So if women like them, like men like those, why don't women like me? I would go out tonight. first heard the Smiths demo tape um, uh, well I, I had that kind of feeling you know I, I, you couldn't immediately say oh well of course they've been listening to the Velvet Underground or the Doors or somebody like that it did seem to be something which had just arrived uh, which is one of the wonderful things that happens in in pop music you know is, is the fact that things suddenly spring full armoured from the ground probably another misquote but I mean you, you know what I mean um, and, and appear to have not been influenced by anything that's preceded them. They've given rock music and Englishness that no other group has, not even the Beatles. Because the Beatles were singing in American accents, by and large. And one could say, yes, you know, they did all this and they brought in this Liverpudlian accent, and the Rolling Stones, right, this Cockney thing, the Sex Pistols, right, this, you know. I think the Smiths are the, the first group to have perfectly integrated this form to a point where um, they are the first real, you know, the first great pop group. Uh, the first great English pop group, the first original pop group. I mean, that's going to get, you know, really, I'm really putting myself on the line there. But I think at the end of the day, in ten years' time, when I stake what remains of my critical reputation on this, but in ten years' time, this will be viewed in the same way that the, the Beatles um, are now viewed. I feel the Smiths create their world. And not many groups do that. It, it, in much the same way, if you'd like, as people like George Formby created their world. And uh, the Smiths create their own environment. And you can either go in or you can say, no, I want Diana Ross instead. And it's your choice, really. The, Smith, the Smiths came together quite by accident, really. It just suddenly happened, which sounds almost unbelievable, but it really did. It, it really did happen in a very sudden, very casual way. The meetings between the group members was very, very uh, accidental, almost. And it was also at a very barren time in 1982 when everybody seemed to be lost and the vile elements were taking over and everything was, music was, was, was just horrendous and it was very synthetic and it was very fake and it was, the pop star was back and the regimented pop star was back and the punk ideals for the first time seemed to be totally dead really you know, i think it just needed some kind of kick in the face the music scene as, at, at the time because i think there's like the human league you know orchestral I maneuvers mean, a lot of groups like that that were just churning it out i mean it was like okay yeah that's okay but there was nothing that was and it, with sort of like intense no, no kind of intensity you had all these synthesizer duos and all this kind of 
um, with mixing metaphor, really corny as hell, metaphorical lyrics with 18 syllable names. I mean, so we, we just went, and because we understood all that totally, and because, as I say, I've been involved in it to an extent and observed it in London, we, we just turned the whole thing around. We called ourselves the Smiths, and, um, and, and then and Morrissey took it into his own sphere totally, on top of the pots with national health glasses, flowers out of the back of his trousers, um, uh, and standing up for um, the, the gawk. Because the years previous to the Smiths were quite dank for me, I, I could see this as my absolutely, perhaps, sole key opportunity to do something constructive and to do something worthwhile. So therefore, when the time came to actually mount the stage, it was almost as if this strange, um, this strange forceful character completely took over and just... I, I actually stayed in the wings, almost. And it was... Ultimately, I feel that that was really the natural me. Because most people feel that when you go onto a stage, you act or you develop some kind of character. But I tend to do that when I'm off stage. And when I'm on stage, I can relax and just be the normal me. Whatever that may be, the abnormal me, perhaps. So I, did it for a I mean, on the face of it, we wanted to ditch everything that people superficially think is rock and roll. Leather trousers and... Uh, and long hair and drugs, but the most important thing of, of aspects of the rock and roll, i.e. the gang mentality, with something exclusive, exclusive to say and arrogance, um, was our forte and still is. A sort of video. I took one look at Morris, he was sitting at the tea table at the time, and I couldn't believe it. This emaciated man hurling flowers about the place this fantastic, you know, uh, pale, pale features and uh, chiselled jawline, you know, I thought, he's for me. <laughs> it's like sometimes if something's happened and you can go up to your bedroom, put the Smiths on, and you think, oh, well, thank God I've got Morrissey, Morrissey's still with me, he's like still st saying them words to me, he's still there. And like even whatever happens, no matter what you've been through, Morrissey's always there to comfort you, he's always there to come up your speakers and sing to you. <laughs> I wouldn't want to characterise a typical Smiths fan, but I, you know, you could say that there were certain things that they would be interested in, like being different, like perhaps being rather more solitary, um, and those are perfectly honourable, worthwhile things. Well, male, as you say, late teens, lonely, dejected, um, failed in love, you know, very nervous, no confidence whatsoever. Um, a box bedroom rebel. That's basically it, the stereotype. And that's not me. <laughs> I don't think I'm a boy anymore. In, in a live capacity, the audience seems to be predominantly male. And it seems... It, it, can, it, it can be a very celebratory event. Almost violent, very, very wild. Which I'm quite happy about. Because I think people don't really have many opportunities in life to let themselves go slightly and express themselves and step out of themselves and so on and be a little insane. There is a light that never goes out. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a song. I mean, and every night that I saw them play live, uh, people were singing along to this song. They would go completely haywire. I mean, and, and the actual lyrics are a kind of, you know, an invitation to a sort of a, you know, Double suicide. This very strange sense of humor, not a, a not a, a morbid sense of humor, but it's so straight, and he can say things so uh, seriously, and yet maybe behind it all, it's, it's quite the opposite. And I think a lot of people mi totally misinterpret, totally, totally, whatever he says and things he does. People they choose to see yes, the Smiths being very morbid and maudling and you know very northern and gloomy, and yet they're not. I mean. Lots of Johnny's guitar playing is really jubilant and very um, 
celebratory. It's really beautiful. Lots of their music when I hear it, it's really uplifting. I mean, on more than one of more than one occasion, I've actually laughed out loud at uh, uh, Smith's lyrics, and I don't often do that. I don't often laugh out loud at anything much. And I, I, I think that they're, they're very funny lyrics, and I, I cannot understand why people assume that. Uh, what they do is, is essentially miserable. I suppose because there are a lot of references to kind of death and pain and so forth in the lyrics, but again, it's done in, in the same sort of way as, as like books like The Loved Ones, you know, where, where it is, it's sort of ironic, really. And, and, and uh, I don't see them as being miserable at all. I get rather cross when people tell me they are. I dreaded sunny days, so I'll meet you at the cemetery gates. Keats and Yates are on your side. Morrissey and I quite often, he'd just telephone and, we'd, you know, he'd say, oh, let's meet somewhere. We used to go walking on fine, sunny afternoons to Southern Cemetery in Manchester. So we go inside and we gravely read the stones. All those people, all those lives, where are they now? Oh, with love and hate and passions just like mine. They were born and then they lived and then they died. Seems so unfair. I want to cry. It was very peaceful and beautiful, but it wasn't done in any sort of morbid sense. Talking about it now seems quite strange, but at the time it seemed very natural. Or we'd go wandering in the moss side and um, just, oh, hours and days wandering, just the two of us, you know together but very alone at the same time. It's like extremely intimate but then extremely sort of very separate. We were always quite separate at the same time. The death of a disco dancer Well it happens a lot around here and if you think peace is a common goal, that goes to show how little you know. Well, we did, you know, quite often go out. We said, let's, you know, go out tonight. And there'd be all these sort of hairdressers in wonderful clothes, and they all look so happy, and they'd be dancing, you know, drinking. Morris and I just sort of sat there like we're at a funeral. I never talk to my neighbour, I'd rather not get in I mean, we would follow people around, sort of like little lambs, sort of looking at them, saying, oh, aren't they beautiful? And, like, we were looking through a window at somebody. He'd say, do you think they're really happy? And I'd say, well, I, you know, I think so. I hope so. And he'd say, well, you know, can we ever be like that? Could I ever be like that? And, of course not. No, he can never be happy. <laughs> I don't think. I pray to God that one day he's happy, but, you know, <laughs> it's taking a long time coming. I've never heard him say, I love you ever, in a song, or um, I don't like you. He never has said anything positive. It's, it's kind of... He hides behind uh, other people's experiences all the time. But I think that's what he's trying to say about himself each time. How do I write those songs? In, I write them in a very natural way, but in a very detached way also. But not to say that I, I simply sit down and guess. But it is very detached, which I think is also important because not everybody has fantastically, endlessly romping um, private lives, as we know. There is a sort of ambiguity. I mean, you're never quite sure who he's singing to or who he's singing about. I mean, the genders are all very, you know, I think it's wonderful, just wonderfully vague. So therefore, whoever you are, whichever sex, I mean, you can almost listen to the songs and you can interpret them, you know, to fit your life, give them, you know, your meanings. There's some very disturbing things going on in those lyrics. Um, but, from what I've gathered, I mean, Morrison is, 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 is very, very touchy about the whole male-female gender thing. Um, he seems to think of a view Things as a third, there is a third sex, <clears throat> which you know that appears to be his belief, um, and it certainly works. 
yeah, really works. I think, I, I, you know, things like Handsome Devil, which is a, is a, you know, I mean, if, if the Rolling Stones had done that song, they would have never gotten away with a song like that. Never. I mean, if they'd have done that. Um, because it's, you know, I mean, it's basic homoerotic imagery. I wouldn't say that I sing from a, a, a staunchly male point of view. I think I have enough scope to really imagine how practically almost anybody would feel. And for me to sing in an exclusively male point of view is just very standard, really. One doesn't have a particular sex when you sing. I mean, you've had so many lifetimes being a man or a woman or indifferent. I mean, so you can sing about all of those. But I would do it in the first person. He does it in the third. <laughs> needs to read obsessively. I mean, you know, devouring book after book after book. I mean, it's a really essential ingredient in our lives. And most of the books we read were by women or about women, or somehow, you know, a woman sort of popped up somewhere. People like Sheila Delaney, I was very, and remains so very obsessed by, Oscar Wilde, um, a lot of feminist writers. I was very interested in because they, once again, they seem to really, uh, they seem to have the key on very modern uh, situations as far as relationships were concerned. They seem to be, um, feminism, although one can talk about feminism and people can screw up their, their, their brow and say, and back off, I think really they had the key to, to many things which have unraveled themselves uh, within recent years as very strong political topics. Not just feminism, but broader issues. Now, don't keep me waiting. I want a drink. You've had enough. Look, I'm not hanging about in this filthy hole. Wait, where you like, then? Certainly, Sheila Delaney and Alan Bennett, I, I see a great deal of similarity in the way they write and the view that they have. Very northern, very back garden, almost gossipy and very entertaining. That's his influence, I suppose. You get out of here and go back to your fancy man or your husband or whatever you call it. Oh, I give you such a bloody good idea, and that's what you've gone short of. Don't shut yourself up for what you are. You couldn't wait, could you? And now look at the mess you've got yourself into. Well, get out of it without your help. Throw yourself at the first man you met. Yes, you're right, I did. You're man mad. I'm not like you. You know what they're calling you round here? A silly little whore. They all know where I got it from, don't they? Oh, you bloody head off. Get out of I can't really seem to write from a, a point of view that's completely detached from the solid Manchester thing and all those old bonds and all those things that per perhaps uh, I never really liked. But it's just something like, it's like your kidneys. They're just there and you have to put up with them. Because of this constraint, especially living in Manchester where the sex roles are more, you know, clearly defined and, you know, the lads go, you know, whatever, to the pub and, you know, it's, it, it's so sort of clear cut here. And if you do anything slightly different, you know, people do notice and do talk. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so I'm sure Marcy was well talked about. A certain um, violent expressions that people have. Sometimes I can really understand them because sometimes, and certainly when you're like Arthur Seaton from a, a working class background, you have to be very over expressive and you have to be overtly demonstrative in order to get anywhere or to be, be heard and so on. Mum called me Barmy when I told her I fell off a gasometer for a bit. But I'm not Barmy. I'm a fighting pit prop that wants a pint of beer, that's me. But if any annoying bastard says that's me, I'll tell him I'm a dynamite dealer waiting to blow the factory to kingdom come. I'm me and nobody else. Whatever people say I am, that's what I'm not. Because they don't know a bloody thing about me. God knows what I am. I became very interested in film history. Quite specifically, Films from the, from the early 1960s, such as A, A Taste of Honey, 
Saturday night and Sunday morning. Films with a, a common thread, I would say. The common thread possibly being that quite largely such films are kind of loving the family way. We're about people in the North specifically, if with, with their tail trapped in the door almost, trying to get out, trying to get on, trying to be somebody, trying to be seen. And I found it very appealing. I found it very, well, obviously a great identification with that. Because that's really the way you feel uh, in, in Manchester. Shaddy, addy, 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 lock your life! Oi! Shadows! <laughs> Hope uh, my singing didn't put you off. You know, by the time we're burying you, you'll be going off in one of these. Plastic, you know that? Yes, you see, people don't realise. It's all clean lines nowadays. All these frills and fancies are going out. It's all old. Same as I tell Councillor Duxbury, you've got to move with the times. No use living in one style and dying in another, is it? Quite. Sit down, make yourself at home. <coughs> so you're thinking of leaving us, hey? Is that it? Frankly, Mr. Shankly, this position I've held It pays my way and it corrodes my soul I want to leave, you will not miss me I want to go down in musical history Frankly, Mr. Shankly, I'm a sickening wreck. I've got the 21st century breathing down my neck. I must move fast. You understand me. I want to go down in celluloid history. Mr. Shankly. <laughs> well, I grew up in the Old Trafford, Stratford areas of Manchester. I was born in 1959. It was quite hard and obviously very working class. Most of the houses I ever lived in, four or five houses, are completely demolished and all the schools I ever went to were completely demolished, almost as if practically, in a way, as if a complete era was completely demolished in the late 1960s. The strong working class communities were completely um, eradicated, almost. It was almost like a, 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 almost a political movement to completely squash this very, very strong um, body of people, it seems. As I began to buy records in 1965, very obvious pop things of the time, which were the most important things in life to me. And it always remained so. All the records I bought, uh, were, they were friends. These people knew me and I knew them, and they were in my life. Things like Dusty Springfield, Marianne Faithful, and Scylla Black, and the very obvious big 1960s uh, names, which I still have them all, and I still like them even more now. Sandy Shaw. She seemed to have the, uh, a particular street sense. She was just really like a, an ordinary girl and saying whatever really came into her head, although she didn't write the songs. That's how the song seemed. It seemed like direct conversation. And On the day that he came, I got into sort of like, um, oh, you know what it is when you've got kids, you're sort of like your rhythm and your timing and it all goes out. And when, he opened, when I opened the door to him, I was still in my pyjamas. But I, I put my makeup on. And he, I was horrified he might think I was this kind of like Joan Collins type character that even went to bed in her makeup. But anyway, as I opened the door, I mean, these two sort of like, well, sort of stupefied faces. And like Morris, I thought it was going to faint. And, um, well, to be quite honest, I, I've been worshipped from afar a lot, but I've never been worshipped that close up <laughs> that often. And it sort of took me aback a bit. Sandy Shaw has always meant a great deal, quite largely simply because of the records, which I thought had more life, spirit and energy than practically anything else that appeared throughout the 1960s. 
And I think that's a, quite a, a mean feat, really. He started reading off everything I'd ever done, um, B-sides of songs that had never been released, things I said to somebody that I'd said to somebody else and places I'd been that I'd totally... Thought that I just suddenly realised this guy knew my life backwards. There was nothing he didn't know about it. He knew all the good bits and all the bad bits, and he still loved me. And it was such a sense of relief that somebody actually knew everything about me and still loved me. It was really wonderful. And from that point, I began to trust him. I didn't trust his music at that point. I just trusted him, and I thought, well, at least it's going to be a giggle. And in love, the good Like when I went to a photo session with him, he, uh, they put me sort of like on a, uh, a level just above him, so I couldn't actually see what he was doing. And so I was, cl it was clicking when I was looking at the camera, and all of a sudden I looked down, and he'd got these rosary beads out, and was looking up at me like this. <laughs> these rosary beads. <laughs> put them away. you somewhere, where was it? And it said that you're more re religiously inclined than you think. Something. Somewhere. So how much does being a Jehovah's Witness actually help you? Oh, a great deal. It was an effort first off, Morrissey. It was a good four years effort. But now it's, it's, it comes easy. You enjoy it. You know I like people. Many other people who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, yeah. Certainly is. It's three and a half million of us. I have always admired Viv Nicholson because of her background and the way she, she fought against her background of, of uh, total poverty and pr practical destitution. I was happy in the haze of a drunken hour, but heaven knows I'm miserable now. Her whole story of winning the polls and uh, her husband's dying and her, the disasters that followed and the way the newspaper tabloids haunted her and tried to drag her, her down and um, decry her as an individual. But constantly through the face of this disaster, she had a, a remarkable resilience and fortitude and humour and a great sense of living, which I think is quite rare. I've come, when the money's gone down, I've come down, you know. You can only be there if you've got it, so you can come down in stages, and that's how I got down to where I am. It's the rock bottom now. But I'm enjoying it. I just feel trapped, you know. And it's nice to say, would you like to come to and sit with Morrissey in the car, you know? And, you know sure. It gets me out. <laughs> I like the fact that when punk came along, that it did demystify the whole process of making records, that people realised that if they knocked over a few phone boxes and sold somebody's motorbike, they could raise enough money to put out a single. But in those days, uh, a lot of bands, were per having done that, then broke up because they were perfectly happy to do that. They'd achieved something that they wanted to achieve. They didn't see it as part of a kind of lifelong career process. When punk began, I was 16, 17. It meant a great deal to me because within the Manchester area it was very, very exciting and it was very big and it was very important and there were a lot of key voices within the punk movement who came from Manchester so therefore special attention was paid to the area and it was very thriving, very busy. My only it was nice, long here, here were people practically in one's own backyard who were suddenly known throughout the country because there you could see possibilities for yourself, if you'd like. What do I get? Oh, what do I get? Chicken guitar solo. For 
person who I thought all those groups were crap. Um, because it was at a time when I was getting into crafting songs and writing chord changes and moving things towards middle eights and all those technical um, building of songs kind of techniques. And none of the, those groups could do that. I mean, I understand now that it was probably a good thing for music, but at the time it meant nothing to me. The girl groups and Full Spectre was a big influence, a Redbird record label. That was really my main inspiration in trying to play the music that we ended up playing. Um, get away from particularly duo, synthesizer duo kind of music. Um, drum machine orientated disco music was very quite a big thing even then. And um, I was delving into um, the Redbird collection. A lot of Lieber and Stoller stuff mainly. They, they were and probably still are my favourite writers. Uh, there was one, one day Joe Moss gave me a, a video which was really important to us now of um, a Libra and Stoller interview. It was, as I said, we were a really big influence. And uh, where one of them, I can't remember which, said he just got to the point where he knew who the other guy was and they hadn't met. And he thought, well, if we're ever going to get together, I'll uh, just go over there and knock on his door and so, say, you know, let's get together and write songs. We sounded very, very idealistic, but it caught my imagination, probably because I was, <laughs> and I'm an idealistic kind of guy. And uh, so that's what I did. I think Johnny was the, the, the instigator, really. You know, he just went round and knocked on Morris's door, basically. Then um, he got Mike in, then he phoned me up. It worked right from the word off without getting too sooty about it was that I saw a lot of good things obviously in him that I didn't see myself and vice versa and he was he, just, he didn't say much and he just let me tell him what I wanted to do and then just sat and kind of watched me and checked out my shoes and checked out my hair and all those things and uh, <clears throat> I was taking quite a chance because I was very very fashion conscious and had a very strong image and I wasn't quite sure about what he was going to look like or what he was into at all and walked in his house and he was really taken aback when hello so and uh, so he invited me in first thing I saw was this huge cardboard James Dean crucifix thing so I thought well that's not too bad I'm, I'm on a winner here and um, it brought me to his room and there were all these great pictures of um, with James Dean and a couple of Elvis pictures and stuff and immediately the it became obvious that we had a hell of a lot in common as regards um, our feelings towards pop culture and, and um, records generally. He gave me a whole s series of uh, songs, batch batches of words, and just to see them on paper, I've never, literally never seen anything like it. Even as a fan of serious, quote, serious writers, you know, the Dylans and so on. Because the um, first thing I saw was um, Suffer Little Children. I did have a fixation on the Moors murders that I was perhaps a potential victim, if you like, a little bit younger than the victims. It was a very strong subject in Manchester throughout the 1960s, very, very strong, very almost unspoken thing. It was too horrific for people to, to, to think about and to discuss. I was taken aback completely because it was, the, the content was so, so serious, but at the same time, very, very poignant and poetic. I just looked at them and straight away I worked out the kind of the music that these images evoked. But this is no easy ride for a child cries. Oh, find me, find me nothing more. We are on a southern nesting.
Our immediate goal was um, for a single, for there to be a single with a great song on the A side. Uh, whether it had our names on the label as the group was secondary. It was our names being in the brackets, which was much more important. Very into the, the songwriting ethic. <laughs> In spite of strong interest from major record companies, the Smiths signed with the independent label Rough Trade. Morrissey was able to have complete control over their record sleeves, which featured a series of cover stars rather than the group itself. Many people had expected the group to sign with the Manchester label Factory, which had embodied the city's musical image since the late 70s. It was absolutely crucial that we didn't sign to Factory Records. Without, again, without I'm put, putting down, a, not giving them, discrediting them for anything that they've done in the past, because they have been very important. But I've um, got to understand that their time was a few years before mine. <clears throat> I'm not a, I wasn't a punk rocker. It meant nothing to me, I was too young. I think it's quite typical of newer groups to retaliate and laugh at the previous generation somewhat and do completely the opposite, whatever that may be and whatever it may entail. And within the Smiths there was certainly a, group, certainly a great deal of that because within the Manchester area quite obviously Factory was uh, the establishment. <laughs> The Smiths quickly achieved a degree of success that was unprecedented for a band on an independent label. They produced a stream of hit singles and albums and also became one of the most popular and powerful live acts in the country. I felt that um, we had something that, that was our, ours exclusively. Uh, Image-wise, um, beads, a certain kind of femininity, and um, something which, uh, which was no one else could really grasp and which was like, totally ours and which belonged, <clears throat> not to, to like, just Manchester young people, but to me, my friends. I thought it was quite important to come forth and confront people and to look people in the eyes and say quite specific, strong things instead of poetic, esoteric, veiled things that people had to, uh, people needed streams of um, notes to understand. It was very important just to say, but with words, of course. This beautiful creature must die. This beautiful creature must die. A death for no reason, and death for no reason is murder. And the flesh you so fancifully fried is not succulent, tasty, or kind. It's death for no reason, and death for no reason is murder. And the card that you carve with a smile. 
once it gets into people's living living rooms and it's curious and it's it's not instantly definable and instantly um, not able to instantly categorize it people get confused and uh, unfriendly once a band that has started out on on the programs that I do or on the programs that Kid Jensen and, and now Janice Long do starts to achieve some kind of success outside that kind of nighttime Radio 1 area uh, it's very convenient for DJs and producers who don't like it to say, oh, well, this is a kind of John Peel band, and therefore to not program the records. I think the Smiths are possibly the, the only group who has been continually successful in a chart sense without the aid of daytime radio. And now things do not improve because daytime radio... DJs are, are perfectly aware of the fact that the Smiths exist in a world that's totally separate to theirs. When you move in uh, such um, a pleasantly smooth and, and uh, monotonously organised um, institution, if you like, and if you don't really quite flow with that, uh, you do seem to be, shall we say, a troublemaker. It's like all those old uh, film stars who had their own notions about what they wanted to do. They were box office poison because they, you know, they really knew how this film should go. And anybody who, who has any degree of um, control, inner control over their own art, uh, well, it's hard really to fit them into the pop world because obviously the pop world, quite sadly, is, is um, one of... Um, little depth, shall we say. This summer, at the peak of their success, Johnny Marr left the Smiths. After several weeks of uncertainty, the group officially split up. It was the end of the most original English band of recent years. I always felt, and I don't, you know, this was a couple of years ago when I, the four of them were together, that there was there was a three. There was Morrissey, and it wasn't a, you know, a very uncomfortable difference, but there were differences. Johnny is, is a, you know, I mean, he's not, a, he's not a straightforward anything. He's an incredibly sharp, very, very sharp kiddie, as he would probably refer to himself as, um, and is a great guitar player. I mean, he, he is one of, one of the last, the, the guitar heroes, you know. And, I mean, he's been asked to do sessions for Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood and all the, you know, all the old hags. <laughs> Well, I have to answer just totally personally from Johnny Marr's point of view, uh, uh, being very selfish, I, I write, write for myself, I do write for the group, and, and we constantly try and impress each other, which is of utmost importance, because uh, we value each other's opinions, I don't think there's any, anyone better, and, and vice versa, but... Um, no, I've always, so I've always written for myself. The way I see the whole spectrum of pop, popular music is that it is uh, slowly being laid to rest in every conceivable way. Even if you look at Madonna, I mean, Madonna I don't think could ever happen again, a Madonna figure. It seems like the final um, um, fem female pop icon, if you like. I mean, what could follow Madon Madonna in that sense? So with the Smiths on another level, I really do think it is true. I think this is really more or less the, the end of the story. Ultimately, popular music will end. I mean, that must be obvious to almost anybody. And uh, I think these, you know, the ashes are already about us if we could but notice them. <laughs> Heard this one before